stories. <laughs> okay, so now this is really actually official. Um, and we are uh, studying uh, the weekly Torah portion. And we come to um, the uh, uh, really, really emotional scene at the beginning of our Torah portion by Yigash, by Yigash, page 274 in the Eitz Chaim. This is Genesis chapter 44, beginning with verse 18. So whatever source you have, that's where we start. And the Torah reading um, brings us, I, I hate to spoil it for everybody, but it brings us into uh, um, the unification of the whole family, Joseph and his brothers and his father are finally all brought together um, with Pharaoh's support and uh, they're all brought down to Egypt. So it's a very, very uh, um, kind of uh, at least somewhat happy ending as far as that goes. And then there's a coda, uh, the last couple of pages in, in, uh, in, the, in the way the Torah reading is divided up in Aliyot uh, the last aliyah, the seventh aliyah, and going to the end of the Torah reading, is there's a coda of bringing us back into Joseph's uh, career as the viceroy of Egypt and how he has to take care of not just his family, he's got to take care of the whole country. And how does he go about doing that? So that's the, that's the overall set of topics that we have um, in our Torah reading. And uh, it, as I always do, I invite if anybody here has a particular section that they have paid attention to, that they have questions about, that they have something they want to focus on. Anybody have a suggestion for that? No. Yeah, Carolyn. I just find it interesting when they have their meal together, they all eat separately. That already happened last week. Yeah. Right, that already happened last week. About that, yeah that uh, um, they're set up uh, separately, uh, the Egyptians and the Hebrews and, the, uh, uh, and, and Yosef, um, because the Egyptians can't stand, it's an abomination for them to eat with Hebrews. Like, yeah, talk about what we were talking about before, about having Kiddush and Birkat HaMazon, they go, unbelievable, five minutes, these Jews, they have to spend so much time and Birkat HaMazon is disgusting. So they end up you know, se separating themselves off. Um, yeah, so that's, that's um, already laid out for us last week. And um, of course, that whole question of who is this masked man? Who is this strange man um, that is tormenting the brothers? They don't, they don't know, right? Um, all of this time, we get this motif of he knows them, they don't know him. He knows them, they don't know him. And as a result, they're, they're confronting this mysterious, uh, powerful man who is doing all kinds of things that are hard for them to understand. And uh, last week already, um, they started breaking down. They started feeling this must be a divine punishment for how we mistreated our brother. He, he begged us to have mercy and we didn't, and we didn't uh, um, yeah. show any mercy to him, um, which is significant uh, because it, it's not reported in the original scene. In the original scene is a very dry reportage of, uh, of how the, the brothers gang up on him, throw him in the pit, and, and you know they have their own discussions about what should they do with him, but we never hear a peep from Joseph. And now we find out years and years later that they have his voice ringing in their ears, that they, that they, can't, they can't get it out of their ears, that he was crying to them and they, and they, and they didn't uh, have Rahmanas. They didn't have compassion for him. And now they feel that they're paying for it. So that's where um, we are, are uh, um, in the opening of the Torah portion. We are in this, hold on a second, Jen. We, we're in this situation where they are standing all in front of Joseph and it seems to be checkmate. It seems to me to be that Joseph has now maneuvered all the pieces um, to uh, uh, get what he wants, although they don't understand why he wants it. But he is now, he has gotten Benjamin to be down there, despite the fact that they didn't want to bring him down. And Jacob put up tremendous uh, resistance. But now he's got, he's got, Joseph, uh, he's got Benjamin 
year. And now he says, okay, I'm holding on to Benjamin. The rest of you can go home. That's where our Torah portion opens up. So they're standing in front of him and they hear this uh, proclamation uh, that he puts out. And that's now their next step is what, how do we respond to that? Jen, what do you want to say? Um, I'm so sorry. It was actually in response to something that happens later on in the Torah portion. And um, just to talk, it, we never talk about it. And it's probably not worth really going over because it's just a small thing. But there's this thing it's worth going over. Okay, it's this, there's this scene. It, it happens somewhere around 46. It's on 284 where Joseph is trying to tell his brothers after things have been sorted somewhat. He's like, when, they, when you go to Pharaoh, you're not going to say that you're shepherds because that's totally abhorrent to Egyptians. So that's not what you're going to say. You're going to say that you breed livestock. And that's what you do. Of course, the brothers go and when they're in front of Pharaoh, they're like, uh, yeah, we're shepherds. And then, but then Pharaoh doesn't seem to care. It's like Pharaoh's totally cool with it. And I feel like, as, again, as a convert, I feel like Joseph is trying so hard to be like the perfect Egyptian. <laughs> so I feel like he's a convert to being Egyptian in a way. And that's like what's going on there. And I've always enjoyed that, weirdly enjoyed that scene where it's, it's no big deal to Pharaoh, actually. Um, he doesn't have to go be a shepherd. So what does he care? <laughs> we, can, we can look at that scene. It's, it, you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of an, um, like you say, it's like a little by, by road along the way, but it's got these very, uh, um, uh, like you say, interesting touches. So, all right, let's look at that. So what happens, of course, is, is that Judah, by um, that uh, uh, Judah is, uh, is uh, moved to uh, approach this uh, strange, powerful man. And he pours his heart out and says, please, you have to have Rachmanus because, and he says, you have to have Rachmanus for me and for my father. It's because he says, I, I cannot, I will not be able to live to see my father's heart broken if we don't bring Benjamin back. Take me instead. Because I just, if I, I cannot go back to my father and see my father's heart broken. And of course, this whole thing is about, uh, um, just real quick, that Joseph, and then Joseph breaks down crying and Joseph reveals who he is. Um, Judah, you know, sort of puts it out there in a very honest way. He says, I know my father doesn't love me as much as he loved jo uh, Joseph, the disappeared one, and as much as he loves Benjamin. I know that. So I'm, I'm, and guess what? I still am so devoted to my father that I cannot bear that my father's heart will be broken a second time if he loses Benjamin. He won't be brokenhearted if he loses me. And you know what? I can take it. So let me be the hostage or let me be the, the, the prisoner. And please send Benjamin back to my father because that's the only way that I can live, which is a pretty stark um, you know, uh, uh, declaration and a pretty stark uh, kind of uh, um, awareness that this man has been living with, and I don't think that it's been, you know, necessarily just this very moment. This is, this is, you know, what what happens, and and Joseph, at that point, can't can't take it anymore, right? Uh, um, of course, that's a mirror image of what the brothers were doing when they threw him away. When they threw him away, they didn't give a damn about what their father's heart would feel. They knew that their father's heart would be broken by getting rid of Joseph. But they were so infuriated and they were so uh, um, hateful and they were so resentful. Uh, we talked about this already before. Um, so that early episode that's so famous, that was in many ways, not just revenge against Joseph, but revenge against their father. And now, Joseph, uh, Judah says, no, that's over. It's over. We're, we're done uh, causing pain to, to our father. We can't do that anymore. So uh, that's the, the, the tshuva, that's the repentance that happens here. And uh, Joseph breaks down and says, it's me, it's me. And they first, they're shocked. And uh, I said, it was sort of like a happy ending but it, and this is going to just be a long introduction to bring us to, to the moment that Jen wants us to look at. Um, there's a lot of awkwardness. There's still tremendous amount of guilt. 
and fear. You know, it's, it's, it's very uh, hard for them to imagine that this Joseph guy is going to be magnanimous to them and is going to be nice to them. Um, they weren't nice to him. And uh, he has every right to, uh, um, you know, to, uh, to do whatever he wants with them. And he's got the power. So um, anyway, then we have, we're skipping a little bit, but he finally brings uh, Jacob down with him. And now they're all standing in front of Pharaoh. And that's where we start with, um, um, we're gonna be in the middle of, um, after a long genealogical uh, list, um, we're gonna get to uh, um, Shishi, the sixth Aliyah, which will begin chapter 46, verse 28 on page 283. But Michael, yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, I'm, I'm just struck by how much favoritism there is throughout the, the Yosef story. I mean, it starts, Yosef is the favorite, the brothers resent it, you know, and he gets, and that, that gets him into the pickle, you know, and now Benjamin is the favorite, and Yehuda is coming out and saying, you know, I, I can accept that I'm not the favorite, you know, but I, you know, but these family relations are still important to me. Yosef, on the other hand, doesn't quite buy into all of this. Yosef still shows all of this favoritism towards Benjamin. You know, he gives Benjamin all the, uh, all the extra gifts. Uh, and after loading up, and when he sends them away, after uh, loading up uh, Benjamin, you know, with this bounty, you know, relative to what the other brothers are getting, he says, and by the way, don't quarrel when you're on your way back, <laughs> back to your father, you know, as if, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't pay attention to the favoritism that I'm showing as well. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's the given. Um, I, I, I would say the opposite. He, uh, Joseph, it's not that Joseph doesn't buy in. Joseph does buy in. Joseph says, yes, we live in a world where people pl um, have favorites in their, in their heart. And I do. And now we're all going to live with it. And, and uh, you know, the fact that, that Benjamin is my full brother and the rest of you aren't, you know, that doesn't mean that we're not a family, but yes, I totally am completely devoted mostly to, to Benjamin um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the rest of you are taking second fiddle and, and, and uh, live with it, get used to it. Um, so yeah, we've, we find it very disconcerting um, ex and because uh, it, it's it's not that it's not true as a as a as a fact of life, it's just you're not supposed to talk about it, right? It's it's uh, you know it's it's the rare uh, situation where a person can say, um, "I love all my children ex completely equally," right? Um, it's a it's a it's great if you could. Um, maybe it's not so rare, but it's not unheard of, um, and it and it's not outrageous that that you know somebody has the favorite, you know that somebody is the favorite, and at night and it's not necessarily the youngest, although sometimes it's the youngest, um, but you know if there's something about a person, you know relating to some other personality quirk in that other human being, that just is uncontrollable. That's that's you know that's where your heart just ma you know magnetically goes to. Um, what what I like to think is that 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 doesn't mean that there is no love anywhere else, right? That uh, for for Judah to have that kind of devotion to his father um, makes me want to imagine that they had some kind of you know connection, just not. The, the magic, the magical, irrational connection that Jacob felt to, uh, um, well, to, and it goes back to favorites and wives, right? The, the favoritism goes back to Rachel being the favorite and Leah being the also ran. So, you know, those, those uh, Joseph and Benjamin are, are, are Jacob's souvenirs of his lost love. 
it is know, that wonderful uh, line that they're soulmates that right which right. is right at the beginning right at the beginning of of this torah reading v'nafshot tzura b'nafshot and it doesn't say whose soul his soul is bound up in his soul but it doesn't say which soul is bound up in whose soul because it goes back and forth um yeah so you're right and 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 you would have liked to see a little bit of learning from mistakes you would have liked to see a little like control this favoritism a little bit don't be so so upfront about it um but in a certain sense maybe that's I mean, and that's one of the challenges that'll go through this week and next week. And we're, and I know we still get it. We, this is really relevant to Jen, to what, to, to this moment. Um, um, how honest can you be in your family? How, how much can you actually put out there on the table um, and share with, the, with the, the people that are bound to you soul to soul, whether they like it or not? Um, and, and uh, you know, how much can you say, you know, I love you so much more than I love you, but I love you too. Um, uh, so, you know, how, how much honesty can there be? Um, just to, to, you know, push that a tiny, tiny bit. Um, everything is happening here under the shadow of Jacob's own dishonesty. Right? Jacob is Jacob because he tricked his father. Um, so working out afterwards, when you can bend the truth, when you can you know, uh, skip around the truth, when you have to be fully truthful, that comes up again and again and again and again. Um, starting with, with, with Jacob, going through his whole life with his wives and his father-in-law and, and so on. And then with the kids and the children with him, how much they're honest with him before the Joseph story. And then the Joseph story, of course, is the big secret. This family has been living with a secret for 20 years. Um, and now things um, come up one way or the other. So with that as background, um, let's um, let's let's look at page two eighty three, starting with verse twenty eight. One more piece of background, and that is they're all on their way, right? They're all on their way now. It's a long caravan of the entire clan, Jacob and all of his uh, offspring and their offspring. You know the magical number seventy people are are accounted for. That's verse, you know what, well, we'll start with verse 26. Okay, start with verse 26, 282. Who's going to do the reading today? Carolyn, okay. Um, let's see. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt, his own issue, aside from the wives of Jacob's sons, all the persons numbered 66. And those of sons who were born to him in Egypt were two in number. Thus, the total of Jacob's household who came to Egypt was 70 persons. He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to point the way before him to Goshen, so that when they came to the region of Goshen, Joseph ordered his chariot and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. He presented himself to him and embracing him, Around the neck, he wept on his neck a good while. Then Israel said to Joseph, now I can die, having seen for myself that you are still alive. Okay, so we get the 70 uh, uh, people that that's, and then it says he had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph. Who sent Judah? Jacob, probably. That's what it's, that's what it, yes, that's the context. That's what it is there. So judah is the the main guy right judah is the guy um even though he is not the favorite most beloved son he's the leader right he's the trusted one after all he's the one that jacob actually trusted benjamin uh to take in his custody down to egypt um so judah has this uh 
you know, working relationship with his father and his father trusts him um, and, and has, uh, uh, you know, sees him as, as, the, as, the, as the person who, who knows his way around literally. So he's the one who's going to point the way. Okay, they get there. Joseph comes. There's an emotional greeting between uh, uh, Jacob and uh, Joseph. Let's just note, without pushing it too hard, verse 29. What does it say there again? Um, Joseph ordered his chariot and went to Goshen to meet his father, Israel. His he father who? Israel. Right. I didn't, we've been having Jacob the whole time. We had it in verse 26. Um, we had it before that, of course. Jacob is the name that's mostly been used to, to, to uh, refer to uh, the patriarch. And now it's his father, Israel. And then when we get to uh, 30, what does it say? Then Israel said to Joseph, now I can die having seen for myself that you are still alive. So with that, as I say, pushing it too hard. Do we want to do any Midrashic uh, comment uh, on, on this? What, what, what might it convey to us that all of a sudden this, this man is called Israel? Yeah, Jen. Um, a couple of things come to mind. He's um, meeting Joseph after all this time. So there's a slight distance to him. And Israel seems a more formal name for him. One that he has as, as you know, um, the uh, patriarch of Israel right now, as opposed oh. to his more personal, you know, given name. Um, also, and Joseph must seem a little bit of a stranger. He probably looks totally Egyptian and completely different than what he remembered. And, you know, so there's, they're meeting for a first time. And, and in some ways, Jacob is coming as a representative of this whole family, which is not quite the family Joseph belongs to, even though he does and he doesn't. Yeah, good. All, all good. Anybody else? Michael. Um, wasn't uh, Jacob renamed Israel as part of a revelation from God earlier with the, with the name change? Uh, and, but paradoxically, after God changes his name from Yaakov to Yisrael, there's a revelation earlier in this chapter where it says that God appears to Israel and says, Yaakov, Yaakov. You know, the name just keeps flip-flopping back and forth. So even, even God seems confused as to what to call him. Well, or we, or I don't know if God, God is, please, please. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's just say that God uses the name that God chooses depending on what it, what it needs to be. Um, so, but I, you know, I mean, this is a, this is a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a like I say, I don't want to push it too hard. I think it's intriguing. I think that the fact that it flips back and forth, saying that it's just a matter of confusion is not satisfying to me because I think that it would have been, if that's the way people saw it, it could have been very easily, you know, edited um, to make it smoother. You know, we could, have, we could have switched over to Israel after the big revelation moment, which is actually, you know, doubled. It's, it's twice re reconfirmed. Um, and, and then we just keep going. And in, and in sometimes in the, in the same verse or two, you know, here it's just a couple of verses away, but, uh, you know, we go back and forth. Um, and uh, the, the text that you point out, right, um, is um, right before he's called, you know, Israel and verse, just to, for people to appreciate the, the, the point that you're making, on page 280, chapter 46, verse 2. Geraldine, you got it? Um, yes. God called to Israel in a vision by night. Jacob, Jacob, he answered. Ah, right, so that's what Michael is pointing out. There in the very same verse, the narrator chooses to refer to Jacob as Israel. Um, and then when God is, is uh, you know, tapping him on the shoulder in his dream. He says, Jacob, Jacob. Um, so 
I do think that there is a, an argument to be made that there's a, a, an intimacy or personal quality of Jacob. Jacob is Jacob. And then there is an official, you know, what Jen was, was uh, there's, there's a, you know, the head of the clan, right? Or the person who has some kind of burden of destiny uh, upon him, the one who wrestled with God. Um, you know, this official title, which Jacob doesn't wear all that comfortably, right? And the whole time that he mourns his son, he's Jacob. He's not, he's not Israel. So the whole, the whole time that he's living in this dark, you know, uh, uh, prison of, of his own uh, bereavement, he's just, a, you know, this guy, Jacob, who, who, uh, who suffers. So when we have Israel here with, with, with Joseph, we get a kind of, uh, of a mix of, of uh, factors going on. And, and Jen mentioned a whole bunch of them. You know, it's not, you know, for, for, for Joseph, you know, uh, to be, uh, you know, I don't know that it's, it's uh, um, anachronistic to say, I don't think he's calling his father Jacob. You know, uh, um, but, you know, it, it's his father after all. Um, is this a moment of triumph, right? We, uh, Israel is called Israel because you have struggled, you have wrestled with God and with human beings, and you have prevailed, you have triumphed. Um, so this is now maybe a moment of triumph. All of a sudden, Jacob is Israel. Another possibility that is to understand that, and this is going to, believe me, Jen, this is bringing us to your point. It's going to bring us to <laughs> um, there is this, of course, moment now of uh, fulfillment of Joseph's dream in a certain way. And Joseph is the big shot. And his father is in this funny subservient position, which shocked you know, Jacob himself when he first heard the dream. He says, you really mean to say that I'm going to bow down to you? Um, so, so that's part of what's going on here. Um, and maybe this is a kind of a reasserting, yes, Jacob is totally dependent now on the good graces of his powerful, successful son. But never forget he's Israel. Right? He's still Israel, even though he's completely at the mercy of this, of this young whippersnapper, you know, offspring of his. And that's really, I think, very poignant to, to every uh, um, relationship between parents and, and children as time goes on and as the kids grow up and become adults and the parents grow down instead of growing up um, and, uh, and become more and more uh, um, dependent on their children. Um, and, you know, children have, uh, you know, have, have struggled with this forever, but certainly in our modern time, when we talk about the sandwich generation, and you've got, uh, uh, you know, grownups who are stuck between being parents to their own kids and being parents to their parents. Um, there's, there's a very uh, uh, tense uh, anxiety that comes with that for, on both sides, on both mm -hmm. sides. So maybe that Israel part, um, that Israel use here, um, isn't as confused as all that. Um, it, it, maybe it's a very uh, uh, skillful way of, of talking about a confused situation. So, yeah. So that so now he says, and the 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 the, the verse, the statement that uh, Israel says to his son is also very interesting in the, uh, uh, the way that it's structured. Verse 30, what, is, what does Israel actually say to his son? Wait, I have to get back to 30. 283. Then Israel said to Joseph, now I can die having seen for myself that you are still alive. Right. So there's the there's the, the the seesaw, right? There's the uh, the back and forth. Okay. Now you take over. You live. I can die. Right. 
one, one generation moves on to the next. So Joseph is now in this very, very uh, uh, powerful position and very fraught position with regard to his family. And now 31. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell the news to the Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds. They have always been breeders of livestock and they have brought with them their flocks and herds and all that is theirs. So when Pharaoh summons you and asks, what is your occupation? You shall answer. Your servants have been breeders of livestock from the start until now, both we and our fathers, so that you may stay in the region of Goshen for all shepherds are abhorrent to Egyptians. Right. So I, I'm a little uh, skeptical about the way that they put this in the translation. The way that they put this in the translation is that this is what I'm going to say to him, right? There's the, the quotations and then there's the quotations in the quotation, right? So we have Joseph saying to, to, to all the people, I'm going to go and tell Pharaoh the following. And that starts in the middle of verse 31. My brothers and my, my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. Then 32, the men are shepherds. They have always been breeders of livestock and they have brought with them their flocks and their um, herds and all that is theirs. Um, he, this, the translation puts that as part of Joseph's speech that he's telling his uh, family that he's going to say to Pharaoh. It doesn't, it doesn't work for me because he then says to them, don't tell them. And here we get to Jen's point. He says, don't tell them that you're actually shepherds. Tell them that you're cattle breeders, right? Um, so I think that it's a mistake. I think that what happens is that 31 is Joseph saying, this is, I'm going to announce your, your arrival to Pharaoh. And then we have an editorial comment. This is the narrator giving us background. Now, remember, these people were actually, they worked with animals. They worked with all kinds of animals. They were shepherds of, of sheep, but, and they were also, um, you know, any animals that they could acquire. The word mikneh is about acquiring animals, right? All domesticated animals. So they're working with, with big animals, working with little animals. Of course, mostly they, we know of them as shepherds, right? So then that's parentheses, verse 32. Now verse 33. So now back to what we all know, that's background information. Now Joseph says to his family, look, when he asks you, what do you do? What's your, what's your livelihood? What's your profession? What's your, what's your work, right? Tell them only this. Right? So that's the warning, right? That's what Jen was, was, was bringing up before. And again, we have kitoavat mitzrayim kol ro'etzon. Every shepherd was an abomination to Egypt. If you were a shepherd, they couldn't look at you straight, right? You were, you were just disgusting. So Joseph obviously doesn't want them to be disgusting in Pharaoh's eyes. So he's trying to now mitigate any you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, embarrassment or any unpleasantness that could happen. Um, now, actually, that sounds pretty smart. You know, if you, if you, uh, if you're going to introduce yourself to somebody, and and you know that that person hates, you know, uh, um, I am a CEO of a of a corporate rating uh, uh, organization. You know. And you, and you know you, you come to the Dalai Lama and introduce yourself that way, it might not be such a great idea, you know. So uh, um, or to Bernie Sanders, right? You know, if this is something that's disgusting to this person, you could lie to the Dalai Lama then. Well, just don't say it. <laughs> okay. Just you know, I'm I'm in finance. Right, right. That's I, the way it's said. You know, just you know, like that. So uh, um, all right. So now let's see um, 
what plays out. There's other things that we could look at, but well, let's get, because I've, I've been, you know, delaying the, this whole business about what, what Jen wanted to bring up. So now, 47. Then Joseph came and reported to Pharaoh saying, my father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that is theirs have come from the land of Canaan and are now in the region of Goshen. And selecting a few of his brothers, he presented them to Pharaoh. Right. I don't know why. I don't know why the translation says a few of his brothers. It, it says he took five. That's what the Hebrew says. He took five people from uh, uh, from from the end of his brothers, from the edge of his brothers, from whatever. Um, I don't I don't get it. I'm but anyway, sure. here we go. Um, and selecting a few of his brothers, he presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And then we should have them say exactly what Joseph told them to say. But he right? didn't. Right. Now, of course, this also brings us to the question of why is he choosing only a few? Right? There's another favoritism example. Right? There's, a, there's a, some kind of selection is being made. We don't know what his criteria are. And it doesn't tell us who the five are. It doesn't tell us which brothers are included. Is it the four Leah brothers and ben and Benjamin, um, or is it is it some kind of uh, you know is it the four uh, Bilha and Zilpa brothers who we used to hang out with when he was seventeen, um, and his brother? It, it doesn't say. Or is it some mix of all kinds of that? You know does. Is he bringing up people because of whatever skills they have, how they look, whatever? It doesn't say, but he's definitely not bringing all of them. Right. He's definitely, again, this is another one of his maneuverings uh, to try to manage the situation. Yeah. Rabbi. Uh, wait, wait, okay, yeah, okay. So, I'm reading this so, comment by Rashi who says that from among his brethren, from those who were inferior in strength, who do not appear strong, for if Pharaoh will see them as strong men, uh, then he would take them as warriors. Okay, so that's one way of, of imagining what might be uh, going on in in in, uh, in Joseph's mind. Um, this, of course, has been, you know, Rashi is is uh, you know uh, writing in medieval times, uh, throughout medieval times and into uh, early modern times. This has always been a problem for the Jewish community. When they've always been summoned to appear before the authorities, whoever they might be, King Ferdinand, or 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 uh, you know wh whoever, um, who do they send? Do they send the best and brightest? Do they send the least, and the you know the the least impressive? Because if anything bad happens, at least they say, well, you know why it happened? Because 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 that person that that would that represented us is a schlub. So uh, um, this has been a, a, uh, a historical motif, you know, throughout Jewish history. And Marashi is reflecting one kind of sense of, of, uh, of, 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 of worries that people had. Um, he's hiding his brothers just the way Yocheved hid Moses, right? That's, that's one way to look at it. Okay. So... Pharaoh, Pharaoh now, you know, asks the question that that uh, Joseph knows that Pharaoh is going to ask this question, right? I don't think you have to be a prophet to, to assume that Pharaoh is going to say that. You know, this is basic chit chat kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's a, it's you know the kind of question at a first encounter. Oh, and what do you do? Oh, what do you do? You know. So, uh, um, but nevertheless, it's definitely predicted by Jacob by Joseph, and Joseph tells them what to say, and instead. What they say is, and this is starting from verse three one more time. Okay, but could I just say one thing? Sure. Could it be that he selected them because he thought they would be the ones who would say what he told them. <laughs> that could be too, right? I mean, he, look, he is the boss, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's had them quaking in their boots now for quite some time. Can he possibly imagine that they're not going to listen to him? That's you know part of the irony of what's gonna what's gonna come up here. Yeah, so go ahead. Okay. Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? They answered Pharaoh, 
We, your servants, are shepherds, as were also our fathers. We have come, they told Pharaoh, to sojourn, to sojourn in this land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, the famine being severe in the land of Canaan. Pray then, let your servants stay in the region of Goshen. Then okay, Pharaoh that's it. That's their, that's okay. their statement. Um, so... This, is, this was Jen's opening question. What do we make of this? They're not following the script, right? Joseph was totally clear about this. And they're not, and, and, they, and not only that, they, they go on and on. That's not their job. Joseph is, has arranged everything already. He told them already, I've, I've taken care of it all. And then they, they say to Pharaoh, we, Pharaoh, can you please let us stay here? We're, we're in a lot of trouble. Um, you know, we're starving to death. And, and of course, they, they fess up to the fact that they are mostly see themselves as shepherds and, and not as, as uh, livestock cattle uh, people. So, so what do we do with that, with that uh, kind of response that, they, that they're in, engaged in? So, OK, Audrey and then Jen. I think the most obvious thing is that pe people just don't want to lie about who they are. That they, you know, they're not buying into that they are doing something to be ashamed of. And uh, like that just might be a bridge too far for them. And could be some sort of assertion, self assertion, uh, even a bit of redemption that they're not going to. Uh, lie about themselves because they're afraid they might have been might be done with that so so when this is a situation that many uh, refugees immigrants find themselves in you know throughout again throughout history and and in today's world right you you're, you're caught crossing the border Right? or you're coming in in an official checkpoint or something. And the question is, what's at stake here? Let's remember what's at stake. And they tell us what's at stake. In their speech, they're saying, we have nothing to eat. We need to be welcomed by you. <clears throat> well, if we need to be welcomed by this guy, didn't we just hear from the guy that knows <clears throat> what's going on here that we should not tell this person something that's going to make him feel disgusted of, about that? Yeah. Right? Shouldn't we sort of like soft pedal anything that will make our appeal, make our request uh, denied? We don't want our request. We don't want him to say, get out of here. You, you people are disgusting. And yet that's what they say. They know that they could be bollocksing this up royally, so to speak. And, and, and that's what they say. Just because they don't want to be liars, just because they're George Washington and I cannot tell a lie? Jen, yeah. I, yeah, I, I kind of actually thought it was more, um, I would imagine that this is a different situation than they're usually in, to be in the Egyptian court before Pharaoh. And presumably, Egypt well, would- Remember, they've had a lot of practice because they've been at, you know, uh, in front of yeah. this, this almost Pharaoh. That's true. That's true. But I, I still think depending on which brother he took, I, I don't know that just genuine nervousness and because so much was at stake took over. And, and there's just like, a, you know, um, words are just pouring out of the mouth because now it's real and now you have to actually get an answer. And Joseph's instructions just like went right out of their heads in that particular thing. I knew what, for me, that's what would happen to me. Some word salad would come out of my mouth about my desperation. So reading into it. Like, I, I think that's what's going on here. I can't believe they're like deliberately dissing Joseph or his advice. No, so I, I it's think that it, it's not possible that maybe what they're doing is in some way motivated by saying, we are not going to let you rule our lives. We're going to ask Pharaoh. You're not Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. It depends, yeah. If you're if you're totally in command of yourself, for sure. So it depends on if they're in command of themselves or if they're like a nervous wreck. So I can see that going either way. I have to that I, I, would, I would just argue that the feelings are so deep that you're a nervous wreck and have some very strong feelings that you 
you know, almost can't control, but that are very much about, I'm sticking up for myself here and I'm not going with this guy who I have never been able to accept as being my Lord and master um, and, and the hell with it. Um, to, to editorialize just a little bit more, we live in a country where um, half the country doesn't understand why the other half of the country constantly chooses to support policies and people against their own best interest. Right? From, 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 the, from the perception, to put names on it, right? from the perception of uh, the, the Democrats, the Biden people, they don't get it. Why are people who are getting no support and who will not be made, their lives will not be made better by, this, by, 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 uh, by the Republican party and, and, and by uh, Trump and so on. And nevertheless, you know, they support a guy that, that, that lets the industries mistreat them, pollute their, 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 their uh, neighborhoods, um, you know, cut the, the, the rich people's taxes and not their taxes. You know, all of these things you can say a zillion, zillion, zillion different kinds of things. And in the end, they don't care. Even if it's against their interests, they have something that they stick up for. And the heck with you if, if you think you know better. You know, the complication I have with what you say, Rabbi, is that they have to realize they're only meeting with Pharaoh as a consequence of Joseph's Heksha. It's not as though Pharaoh just uh, randomly picked out these five schlubs. You know, don't forget these were the weak ones. You know, on first know blush, the, I, that's right. No, no, let don't confuse Rashi with the only possible uh, understanding here. We don't know. Rashi puts out a very interesting scenario. Rashi is one way to imagine it. But even if that's the case, that they're the weak ones, that's I think it's a total parallel. What you're bringing up is exactly what we're seeing again and again and again. We keep on asking, why don't they see? Don't they understand? Don't they know that this is what happened? Don't they know that Democrats are gonna take Medicare away from us? Don't they know that the Democrats are the ones that created Medicare and that it's the Republicans who tried? No, they don't, they don't know. Michael. Just getting back to the text for a moment. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see that the, this uh, speech of the five brothers before Paro as being as echoing the speech at the beginning of this parsha that Yehuda is giving uh, before Joseph, you know, Joseph at the end of the last parsha is say, is is telling the brothers, you know, what are your doings? What are you, what is your maaseh? Uh, and Yehuda, in answering that at the beginning of our parsha goes on and on and elaborates and he's eloquent and he, he has a goal in mind, uh, but he's expounding, you know, and doing a lot more than just answering the, the question that's being presented to him. Here too, Paro is saying, Mama Sechem, what are, what are, you, what are your doings? Uh, and, and here too, they are elaborating and they are offering more than, than what is basically what they're told to do, then what is basically be, uh, because of their, their emotions are flowing out and also because they're working towards a goal. Okay, the problem is that, that the situations are very different. The situation beforehand is an unknown person that they're confronting and they don't know what he's trying to do or what he doesn't try to do. They don't know what buttons they're pushing with him or what not. They don't know what he uh, will like to hear and what he doesn't like to hear. So they pour it all out. And of course, yeah, and there's you know plenty to look at. Here, they have got inside information about what not to say to this guy. If you want to stay here and you want to eat, say this and don't say that, right? And then that's it. Um, we, on, we only have a, a, a minus minute left. I want to bring out one more last point. Uh, let's read verse six. Uh, verse five, uh, five and six. Five is very short, real fast. Gerald, and fast. Pharaoh said to Joseph, as regards your father and your brothers who have come to you, the land of Egypt is open before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. 
let them stay in the region of Goshen. And if you know any capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. In charge of my what? Livestock. Yeah. So Pharaoh, it's like turns a blind eye to this whole Toeva business. He completely is unfazed by what Joseph was freaking out about beforehand. And he says, I didn't hear anything about sheep. I heard livestock. The rest of it, I'm not interested in. If any, uh, if any of the uh, of you newcomers are, are good with livestock, I'm happy to have you, uh, you know, contribute to our to our society, right? And to and to the you know uh, my my uh, my overall uh, uh, holdings and and work. So what we have is a very uh, um, pointed, uh, you know, switching around that everything that that Joseph was worried about does not happen, even though they, the brothers seem to have blown it. And uh, um, Pharaoh becomes very statesmanlike and gracious and welcomes the family. Um, and that's a, a, you know, a little bit of a surprise and a shock for us uh, based on what we've been prepared for. All right, Shkoach, thank you. That's unfortunately, that's as far as we can go today. So 